I got uh, drafted and I went to uh, Malford Field where I was stationed for about five months. During that time, the, the uh, I uh, was working as a uh, KP and all those kind of thing, and, and finally was able to uh, get a three-day pass from Malford Field to into San Francisco. I hitchhiked into San Francisco because my present wife was happened to be in San Francisco working, and uh, so I. Um, went to see her, and uh, next day, this was Saturday, and then Sunday, she and I went over to uh, Flyshecker Zoo, see the animals, and at about 11 o'clock, we uh, got out of the zoo, and across the street was a taxi man. He said, soldier, come on over here. He says, I want you to listen to what's going on in the radio. So he, uh, we went over to the car, and here, sure enough, he said the Pearl Harbor has been bombed. All military personnel returned back to the station as soon as possible. Well, we were out in the field working at the time, and uh, and then we normally have a radio out in the field, uh, and it, the you know, news came on, and uh, it was quite shocking, and. Uh, then in about a month or, month or so later, we, were, we got you know, rumors that we were going to be evacuated. And first, they, a lot of uh, people went inland, but that didn't help them any. They, you know, they moved to Stockton, and, and uh, some even went to Reno and all that, but they still got you know, tied up in the evacuation. Uh, I stayed at the Japanese Students Club. There was a, uh, about a two blocks from the campus, and I was staying there with, oh, say about 30 other uh, Japanese Americans. And on the day I was the assistant house manager, let's see, on uh, Sunday morning, I was supposed to pass out the sheets. I was going up and down the second and, and third floors passing out and somebody said, hey, Pearl Harbor has been bombed. And uh, everyone kept saying, where in the world is Pearl Harbor? And we thought of Dutch Harbor, which was, uh, which was in uh, Alaska. And later we found out, of course, Pearl Harbor was in Hawaii, uh, many, many uh, miles away. And so uh, that's my first experience of the of the uh, of the Pearl Harbor uh, on Pearl Harbor um, my uh, I, I was picking peas on my brother's farm and when we came in for lunch uh, we turned on the radio and uh, we heard about the devastating news and um, <clears throat> it, it was quite uh, shocking to uh, f to he hear that and uh, and I couldn't quite think about what uh, what is all about, what uh, what the ramifications this would have on me. Um, I do know that next day uh, when we went to school, that bus ride was very quiet. When we got to school, the principal uh, explained to everybody that uh, we were American citizens and we and that we should have the rights and privileges of, of American citizens, and with his given this that little talk, uh, things settled down and, and uh, life went on as usual at school. I to give you my feeling of what happened when Pearl Harbor struck and the glare and the, the stares I used to get was self-explanatory. just made me feel like <clears throat> digging a hole and burying myself. <clears throat> the, um, it was a shocking news that we had to evacuate. I had two months left on my high school before graduation. I was then able to graduate with my class, but fortunately the Board of Trustees was nice enough to give me my 
complete a diploma. I lived with a family in Berkeley while I was going to school there. And uh, on that Sunday, uh, December 7th, 1941, you know, we were going to church as usual. Uh, it was our custom. But then on that day, we noticed that, uh, you know, something different and ominous was happening. You know, as we passed people standing on the street corners, you know, they would kind of shake their fists at us and uh, yell at us, you know. And we, so we were wondering what was going on. And so we turned on the car radio. We were just absolutely, absolutely stunned to hear that Japanese planes were bombing Pearl Harbor and that, you know, we were going to war. <clears throat> and so... Uh, you know, the rest of the day was kind of like a daze, you know, but we went to church as usual, you know, and tried to maintain, uh, you know, life as usual, but uh, it was a very traumatic day, you know, for us, and, you know, everything that we had planned for school and all that was just up in the air at that point, and uh, we didn't know what was going to happen, so. My family decided to move to Japan in 1932. So I was in Japan from 1932 to 1936. And I was enrolled in Aoyama Gakuin in Tokyo, where I studied for four years before I returned to San Francisco. While I was being brought up in San Francisco, of course I went to Japanese school, but I actually went to Japanese school just to play basketball. And I didn't pay much attention to my study of the Japanese language. So when I went to, J uh, went to Japan with my family, I was just like a new student, just starting to learn how to read and write Japanese. It was difficult at first, but as the years went by, it became easier and became a very good uh, subject for me to learn, and I enjoyed it. My decision to return back to the United States was the fact that I disagreed with a lot of the customs that the Japanese had and I didn't want to be involved in it. And it was actually a man's country in Japan and I did not like it very much. That's one of the reasons I returned to the United States. Well, at the time when the war broke out, <clears throat> my feelings were mixed and I didn't know exactly what to do or what was going to happen. The uh, FBI was going around picking up the uh, Japanese citizens who were, say, uh, head of uh, the Japanese Association or head of any of the uh, commercial, commercial or even, uh, of course, the diplomatic uh, areas. Uh, naturally, they were, they were being uh, incarcerated. But uh, anybody that, um, say, taught Japanese school or anything like this, uh, some of the uh, Buddhist churches, uh, the reverends were being uh, picked up that, that night. So uh, uh, we, in fact, it got to be kind of a status symbol. The guys would say, hey, your dad get picked up yet? Some of the more... Uh, prominent ones, and <laughs> they said, no, my dad hasn't been picked up. Well, I guess he's, no, he's not, much of a, not much of a leader in the community. And that was quite a, quite a status symbol if your dad got picked up. When they took away the head of household, he was the one that took care of all the finances, paid the bills, brought the food in. So the wives were left with five, six, seven, eight children had no idea of what income they had or what bills had to be paid or what to do. Many didn't even drive and they had a car. So they were helpless, completely helpless. We went to the recruiting station and, and uh, to volunteer. And when we got there, the recruiting sergeant stated uh, well, we're all here to volunteer, and the, the sergeant there stated, well, that's fine, but he says, you, are you Japanese? And I said, yeah, so what? And my buddies all said, yeah, what's wrong with that? He said, we're all here to volunteer. 
And uh, he says, well, we have uh, instructions not to enlist any person of Japanese ancestry. And of course, I stated, well, I've got two older brothers that were drafted, and they're already in the army. He said, well, we could take the rest of you fellas. And my buddy said, no, if you're not taking, taking him, we're not going to join right now. So that, that ended that incident. <laughs> There were about 4,000 Niseis in the Army then. Well, you know, they, most of them were discharged as being undesirable. And they classified all of us as uh, 4C, you know, which is a uh, classification for enemy aliens, you know, not suitable for military service. And so, you know, that was a really kind of a bummer for us, <laughs> you know, to be classified as enemy aliens. First Sergeant Green he called me into his water room and there were two striving MPs standing there. And he said, I want you to go with the MVs and uh, I'll find out what it's all about. But I knew Im immediately that because of my Japanese face that, that I was being uh, incarcerated. So uh, I went to, into the Briggs for two nights and uh, three nights, I guess. But anyway, orders came down. Put me in inactive reserve as a corporal and told me to go home. So I went home down to Santa Maria, Guadalupe area, where my fo folks were. And then from there, that executive order 9066 was promulgated. And so we all had to leave our things as it is and just take some su couple of suitcases or something like that. And uh, we were in Gila relocation camp down in Arizona.